In this module, we're going to be dealing with some property management ideas and concepts. And it's not a big chapter, um, not a lot of information here uh, necessarily. It's, but, you know, a lot of real estate agents um, would like to, in addition to providing sales services to buyers and sellers, you might decide to also offer property management uh, services to investors that have rental properties and so forth. Um, you may decide to manage uh, like single family properties for investors or multifamily properties, commercial properties. You could manage HOAs, you know, the homeowners associations. You know, just a lot of opportunities potentially with property management if that's something you decide to do, um, and obviously with a real estate license, and certainly in, in pretty much every state, as far as I know, if you have a real estate license, then you can do property management. Now, I will tell you, some states um, actually have a property management license, uh, which is different than a sales license. Um, the requirements typically are in, in terms of education and so forth. You, you don't, there's not nearly as much education that you have to take, y'all school, classroom study, um, for a property management license. But for those that get a property manager's license, then that's all they can do is property management, okay? Um, it could not do sales at all. But if you have a real estate license, y'all, salesperson or associate's license, broker, whatever, your sales license, then you can actually do sales and or property management, okay? All right, so some of the topics, things we're going to be looking at here are just some of the duties of, the, of a property manager. We're going to talk about different types of leases because that would be a big deal, obviously, if you get into this. What are the obligations of both landlords and tenants and the fiduciary responsibilities that a property manager would owe? So let's jump right in. Um, you know, like I was just saying, you know, some states require a license to do property management. Now, there, obviously there are some states there, there are no licensing requirements to do property management. So that would be something you want to make sure of in your state. Now, obviously, when we get into the state-specific portion um, of this course, we will actually address your specific state in terms of what those requirements are. We'll be talking about some property management, um, usually landlord and tenant, really, requirements here in, in the state-specific portion, okay? Um, but right here in this portion of the course is just some general information about property management. But what are the duties of a property manager? Now, you know, I will tell you, I know they like to ask this question here. What are, what are the duties of a property manager? And it's really two things in, in, in general. And one is to maintain the client's property and two, to maximize returns. Now, I, I'm just, I'm just going to be honest, y'all, or at least in the market that I work in, y'all, I don't see a lot of property managers doing either one of these, quite frankly. Um, y'all, it just seems like this, the, the profession of property management, now look, there are some good property managers out there. Don't misunderstand what I'm saying. But y'all, with every profession, there's some that probably shouldn't be out there doing what they're doing. But you've got a lot of property managers out there, or at least professing to be property managers, and even licensed to be property managers. And you know, all they're doing is sticking for rent sign in the yard, and the first person comes along with first and last month's rent, move on in. You know, they'll collect the rent, take out whatever their fee is going to be, and send the rest to the owner. Y'all, you know, that is not what property managers are supposed to do. Um, that's an extremely small portion of what they're supposed to do. Um, yeah, if you think about it, you got to maintain the property. And as far as I'm concerned, the biggest um, responsibility here is to maximize returns. 
Yeah, I got to tell you, look, back in the day, I had a few rental properties myself and I even got to the point where I was kind of tired of dealing with tenants and managing it myself. So I was looking at hiring a property manager. And I talked to three or four property managers. Um, obviously, I wasn't impressed with any of them. But what I noticed by pretty much every one of them, one of many ridiculous questions they would ask me was, would be, well, how much do you want to rent this property for? And I really never understood that question exactly. Um, so I know the last property manager I actually did talk to, they asked me that question, how much do you want to rent it for? And in this particular property that, I, that we were talking about, I said, well, I think I'd like to get about $1,800 a month. And they said, well, this must be a nice property. And I said, yeah, I think it is. And he said, well, tell me, describe it to me. I said, well, it's about 900 square feet. It's two bedrooms, one bathroom, um, and a family room. <laughs> and they said, and you think you can get $1,800 a month for that? Y'all, I'm going to tell you, that would be way overpriced in this market. Now, I, I get in some markets around the country, that's probably a good deal. But you're probably not even looking at $1,000 a month in this market for that particular property. But, but nevertheless, I said, yeah. Um, well, actually, when they asked me, do I think I can really get that? I said, well, well you asked me how much I wanted to rent it for. So there you go. I'll take $1,800 a month. Y'all, obviously, and y'all, that's your job, property manager. You're supposed to go look at the property, check it out, analyze the market, and then you tell me how much can you rent it for, right? Give me a plan here. But y'all, that's just not what you see um, many property managers doing at all. Look, there's a lot of opportunity out there in this field. I will just tell you a lot. Um, but there's a lot of them out there that are in the field that are just not, they're just not doing what they're supposed to do. But anyway, let's move on. Agency, y'all, you know, the laws of agency would also apply in property management, just like they would in sales. Um, but if we're dealing with property management, now, obviously, so if we're talking about an agency relationship, it means we must have a client that we're, we are representing. Well, who's going to be the client? Who are we representing? And the answer is the property owner, right? So, there so there's that fiduciary relationship or an agency relationship between the property manager and the property owner. Now, how do you create the agency relationship between a property manager and a property owner? Y'all, again, it's got to be another written agreement. And typically, we refer to that as a management contract or a management agreement. And y'all, we're going to kind of go through some of the key provisions you would see in a management agreement. But obviously, one of the provisions in it would be to establish the, the agency relationship between these two parties. All right, so agency does apply in property management. Now, some of the things that you, we will, um, you know, obviously there's a lot more in a management contract than what you see right here. But y'all, you know, just some things that at a minimum it must include would be a good description of the property so there's no misunderstanding what which property we're managing. We got to identify all the terms and provisions which would make up a lot of stuff throughout this contract. The compensation of the property owner, um, how does that work? How, so how do, we, how do we do compensation with, with property managers? How do property managers make money? Um, you know, obviously, it's, it's negotiable. You could just charge some set dollar amount, um, assuming the property owner would agree to that. Or what I think is probably most common, certainly in this market, is the property manager usually will charge some percentage of whatever the monthly rent is each month. You know, whether it be 10%, 12%, 15%, you know, whatever, you know, something along those lines. Um, and I'm just throwing that out there again as 
as an example, that is in no way to suggest what you should be charging, y'all, because we know commission compensation is always negotiable with real estate. Um, but it, but let's say 10% because that's easier at math and the rent's a thousand dollars a month, then obviously that means your the property manager will make a hundred dollars a month off that property. And then the other 900 would go to the property owner. You know, all that has to be worked out and clearly laid out in the management agreement on how this compensation is going to work. We have to identify what the property manager's authority is would be um, how much authority is the property owner going to turn over to the property manager and i will tell you y'all years ago i used to do property management and i will tell you i don't know that i ever had two management agreements that looked uh, identical because every property owner had different requirements um, i'd have every now and then i'd get a property manager or excuse me a property owner would say frankie i want nothing to do with this property, don't call me about anything. If something breaks, you fix it. And obviously, so I'd have to fix it, pay for it. Now we would deduct that from the rent and so forth. But Bader said they don't. All they want is whatever the rent rental proceeds would be at the end of the month. Send it to me. Outside of that, I want you to handle everything. Don't even bother me about anything. I don't even want to get a phone call. And then I've had total, uh, property owners go all the way to the other end of that scale where they say, um, basically, I just want you to qualify the tenant, find a good tenant, collect the rent. If something breaks, I'll handle it. I've got, I know people, I got contractors, I can take care of it myself, you know, whatever. So they're saying they will take care of pretty much everything except for actually trying to um, collect the rent and stuff like that, okay? So just make sure that whatever that authority is, what those responsibilities are, which is what you see next, you know, make sure those are very clearly laid out in the management agreement. What's the owner going to be responsible for and what's the property manager responsible for? Yo, if it's not very detailed and very clear, I promise you something's going to happen. Something's going to come up. And now we're pointing fin. Well, I thought, well, you were supposed to do that. No, you were supposed That's what I'm paying you to do. And now you got this going on. And, you know, that's not going to uh, go well. I promise you. So just make sure there's no misunderstandings on who's supposed to do what. All right. Real quick, y'all, we're going to look at just some terms, definitions, if you will, that deal with leasing or property management. Y'all, most of these I would assume you're probably familiar with, already heard of. And I will also tell you, y'all, a lot of these terms are very similar. Um, in fact, almost the same, just different terms, but pretty much mean the same thing. But y'all hopefully know the difference between the leaseor and the leasee. Remember, we've already discussed you know, a lot of terms ending in O-R and E-E. -E. So make sure you know which is which. Um, y'all, you see the term called demise. And it says demise just means conveyance by lease agreement. Now, y'all, I'd pay attention to this one. I, y'all, I could see them asking something like this on the exam. But again, demise just means conveyance by lease agreement. Well, what are, what's being conveyed here? Well, we know it's something that's being conveyed by a lease agreement. So, you know, when, the, when parties sign a rental or lease agreement, what's being conveyed from one party to the other party? And... You know, hopefully you've already figured out what that might be, but if you don't, make sure you write this down, make note of it, highlight it. But y'all, you know, it's that bundle of legal rights. Y'all, you know, hopefully you remember talking about that in an earlier chapter. Y'all, you know, the bundle of legal rights, the right to use, possess, control, disposition, quiet enjoy. Remember, we talked about all these things. Well, when you sign a lease agreement, the property owner has now conveyed that full bundle of rights to the tenant. Now the tenant owns those rights. 
Because remember we said when you sign a lease agreement, you've now created an estate, albeit a non-freehold estate. Yeah, I'm doing a little bit of review right now, but remember, if you have a freehold estate, that means you own the property. A non-freehold estate means you lease or rent the property. And with that estate comes the full bundle of legal rights. So when you sign that lease, y'all, that's y'all the, the legal term there is called a demise, which means conveyance uh, by lease agreement. That's what demise means, okay? And then abandonment, y'all says is 15 days of unexplained absence. Now, if you didn't know that, obviously I would remember that. Y'all, in case they should ask you, y'all, we know abandonment constitutes 15 days of unexplained absence. Y'all, if the tenant leaves or vacates the property or they've abandoned the property or, or we're trying to determine have they in fact abandoned the property, well, have they been gone for 15 days or more without any explanation as to where they are or what's going on here? Um, now, why is abandonment such a big deal? Y'all, right now, we're just trying to define some of these terms. When we get into the state-specific portion for whichever state you're dealing with, we're going to actually break this down in the Landlord and Tenant Act or, or law that uh, pertains to your particular state. And you'll see, <clears throat> excuse me, and you'll see why abandonment and, or why you might have to be able to prove abandonment why that's such a big deal. Y'all, we'll get into some of that stuff um, here in a little bit later chapter, state-specific part of it. Uh, but for now, just know abandonment is 15 days of unexplained absence. <clears throat> some other terms, assignment. Remember, assignment, y'all, that's part of that bundle of legal right called disposition. Y'all, so... If, you know, if I own interest in an estate, whether it be uh, freehold or non-freehold, you know, that comes with the right of disposition. You know, that's one of the bundle of rights. What is disposition? Remember, that's the right to dispose of my interest. Um, you know, if I own the property, that means I could sell the property or I could give it away. And once I give it away or sell it, then I have now disposed of any interest I had. I no longer have any interest in the property, right? Well, obviously, if it's a non-freehold estate, which is really what we're dealing with here, obviously the tenant can't sell the property because they don't have the freehold rights. They have non-freehold, but it still includes the right of disposition. Well, how does a tenant dispose of their interest? Well, one of two ways, actually. One way they could assign their interest to someone else, basically let someone else take over the lease, or they could sublet. <clears throat> and if they, if they sublet the property, then that would also transfer whatever rights they had over to wh whoever they subletted the lease to. Um, now, what's the difference between assignment and sublet or sublease? Um, well, if you assign your interest, basically that removes you completely from the process. Now, the new tenant just basically takes over your lease and deals directly with the property owner or property manager or whoever is dealing with it. But if you decide to sublet, then basically you're still in the middle of it. You're like a third party now. But you've moved out and you've sublet to some other tenant. It's just that now when the new tenant pays their rent, they're going to pay it to you. And then you turn around and make your payment to the landlord. So as a, if you sublet, sublease, you're still involved. Okay, now you've transferred your interest, but you're still involved with the lease. Okay, um, y'all, we're going to talk more about that in a little. I know some of you saying, "Well, I didn't think you can do that." Well, well, you can do it, and, and primarily because that y'all, that's part of your bundle of legal rights as a tenant. Y'all, the right of disposition. But we'll talk more about it here in a second. Um, sufferance. 
Y'all remember we talked about tenancy by sufferance again in an earlier chapter. Y'all were talking about non-freehold tenancies. Y'all, that tenancy by sufferance, y'all basically means the lease has expired, but the tenant is now refusing to move out and may even be refusing to pay any more rent. So that creates suffering on the part of the landlord. Kind of makes sense to call it a tenancy by sufferance. But hopefully, if that landlord knows what they're doing, they will quickly uh, get the courts involved and that will um, shift that suffering back over to the tenant. But at any rate, you know, during this period, we call that tenancy by sufferance. A holdover. Your know, holdover is when you have a tenant, say the lease is expired, but the tenant still has not moved out yet or they haven't completely moved out. Maybe they're in the process, but they're still moving some stuff, even though the lease has expired. Y'all, then that's considered a holdover. And I, y'all, I will just tell you, y'all, especially if you're going to get into this field and start doing some property management, you might as well just go ahead and expect, and, and more, more times than not, y'all, you're going to be dealing with holdovers. Um, y'all, sometimes you just have to work with people. You know, for example, um, well, let me, first of all, y'all, here's why this is such a big deal or, or why it's so important, at least for practical purposes. Y'all, oftentimes what landlords will do, y'all certainly say within 30 days of the lease expiring, um, they'll, they'll start looking for a new tenant. Y'all assuming the, the current tenant has already expressed that they're not going to stay. They're just going to move out. They're going somewhere else. So a lot of times the landlord wants to start looking for another tenant because y'all you don't want that property to be vacant any any longer than it's, you absolutely have to be. So they start looking for a tenant. Well, let's say we find a tenant. Um, again, let's say it's we're in June and the lease is expiring on June the 30th. Well, you got a tenant on June the 15th, a new tenant says, I would like to move in um, after this tenant moves out at the end of the month. And you know, typically the way you secure that um, as a tenant to make sure that they hold that property for you, you know, come the next month, is one, you'll put, usually put down a security deposit, maybe even pay the first month's rent, um, and sign a lease agreement. Then that way you're locked in so that when this tenant moves out at the end of the month, the next month, the new tenant can move in. Well, if you're that landlord or property manager, I'm just telling you, you better be very careful what you're doing with this new lease. Because what a lot of people will do, they will just put on there, if it, if it expires June 30th, they'll put on there to start July 1st. You can move in on July 1st. Y'all, chances that that current tenant will be out of there by then is almost zero. And even if they do get moved out, you know, typically there's going to be a little bit of cleanup involved. Y'all got to go in and clean, or I would hope you would, clean it up, make it look nice again for the new tenant. But what are you going to do if the new tenant is still there on the 5th of the month? 5th of July, they still are not completely gone. They still got some of their stuff there. And you've already promised that property out to a new tenant on the first, now you got a problem. Now you got a problem. Um, good chance you're gonna lose both tenants now, right? Um, y'all, so if you're gonna have, y'all, that new tenant, if I would highly recommend, um, if they're gonna sign a lease, you know, for, for a future date, even though there's, with the tenant currently already there, Y'all, I, if it were me, I probably wouldn't have a start day before, say, the 10th, maybe even the 15th. Um, I wouldn't want to be obligated to the new tenant before then. But I would also just tell them, um, but, you know, this is why I'm going to put it the 10th or the 15th, y'all, to make sure that I can get the other tenant out and get the house prepared for you or get the property prepared for you. But if we can get it prepared for you before the 10th, for example, then you can certainly go ahead and move in uh, when it's ready. Uh, but, but I should have it ready no later than the 10th or no later than the 15th, y'all, whatever you put there. 
But y'all don't make that mistake of just putting it on the first. Because y'all, I'm telling you, tenants are going to, a lot of them are going to be a holdover. Well, why is that? Because um, I'm telling you, you might, it kind of feels like, well, that tenant's just wrong. They're doing me wrong. They're causing me all these problems. Y'all, you have to expect a lot of this. Y'all, it might be that the, the, the tenant where they're moving to, y'all, they can't move into the new place until the first. And that's assuming whoever was there before they're moving in has now moved out. So sometimes you just have to work with tenants, even though they are considered a holdover. Um, yeah, I mean, obviously you can charge them rent for the days that they are held over, and, and I would do that. But y'all, you, you, you've got to prepare for that. Expect holdovers. Um, and a lot of that's going to come with experience, but y'all just beware. Repossess. Y'all, that's just an action to take back possession of the property. Dispossess is the act of actually removing a party from the property. Um, now, obviously, don't do that yourself. Y'all, you should never, ever go in... In fact, I would be very careful how much you even say to a tenant. You know, I will tell you, landlords, sometimes landlords get mad at tenants and start making threats and yelling and screaming at them and threatening them and all kind of stuff. Y'all, you know, I'm telling you, that can be could be considered an assault. It's a verbal assault, even though you never laid your hands on them. But y'all, you know, assault is illegal. And you could get yourself in a lot of trouble. So you need to just... One, have patience. Y'all just prepare for stuff like this. But y'all, obviously, you don't want to be the one making threats or, or um, yelling, fussing, arguing with tenants. You tell them what is expected of them, and I would think you would have it in writing. Y'all, otherwise, you're going to have problems with the courts if you've never established anything in writing, laying out clear instructions on when they need to be gone and whatnot. Um, but, but then at that time, y'all, you need to turn it over to the courts and then y'all, the courts will actually handle the dispossessing portion of it. Okay. Don't you try to do that yourself. Actual eviction. Y'all again, here's where some of these terms are just very similar, really meaning the same thing, but a physical ouster of the tenant. Construction or constructive eviction. Now, that's another term I know they, they like to ask about on the exam. And sometimes I'm scared to even say that because now you're thinking, well, these other terms won't be because Frankie didn't mention that. Yeah, they could ask about any of these things. I'm just trying to make you aware of ones that I know they routinely apparently like to ask about. And one is this constructive eviction. Y'all, this, this takes place when basically the tenant is forced to leave or move out of the property due to the landlord's non-compliance. Y'all, just for example, is it possible you could have a property where things are now breaking? Water lines are leaking. Y'all, just stuff don't work anymore. Stove doesn't work. Refrigerator doesn't work. The uh, toilet doesn't work. Y'all, whatever. Y'all, and it just get, and the landlord's not doing anything to fix any of these problems. Can't you see where eventually things could get so bad where the tenant's just forced to leave? I mean, can't even live here anymore. Well, if that happens, y'all, that's, that's called constructive eviction, where the tenant's been forced out because the landlord is not doing what they're supposed to do. They're in noncompliance. Now, we'll tell you, constructive eviction is illegal. So obviously the tenant could uh, take some legal action against the landlord if this should happen. Um, so y'all be careful with this kind of stuff. And then ejectment, y'all kind of touched on this a second ago, but y'all only the courts, and I remember that for test purposes and for practical purposes, y'all only the courts have authority to actually remove a tenant from the premises. Y'all, you better not be out there trying to do it yourself. I don't care how big and bad you are. You're going to be big and bad behind bars if you're not careful. 
you know, you got to go through the courts to get a tenant out if they don't just voluntarily leave when and how they're supposed to. you got to go through the courts and let the courts handle it. All right. Now we take a look at how we can terminate leases. Y'all, you know, there are several ways a lease can terminate, just like any other contract. Y'all, you know, expiration of term, that would do it. You could have a surrender and acceptance. Y'all, you might as well prepare for that as well. Y'all, could you have a tenant sign a one-year lease and four months into it come up, y'all, because something has happened and they can no longer, y'all, they can't be here. They can't pay the rent. Y'all, for some reason, the tenant needs to move out, but yet they still have several months left on their lease. But could the landlord just say, you know what, I understand what you're going through. And could the both parties agree to release each other, terminate the lease, and we each go our own way? You know, mutual agreement. You know, I'm gonna tell you, in my opinion, that's the best way to handle it. Um, I know some landlords say, no, I, nope, you, you signed a one-year lease and you're going to pay me all this rent. Whether you're here or not, I want the money. You know, I've never seen that work out well. You know, you've already, the tenant's already told you, I do not want to be here. And you try to force them to stay here, I do not see things getting better for you. That's been my experience. Um, you know, I just let them go. That be my be my suggestion. You know, maybe the there's some operation of law that would require you to terminate the lease. Breach of contract. Y'all, you know, if the tenant's not paying their rent, they're in breach of contract. So if I'm the landlord, can I terminate the lease and have them evicted from the property? I can. Destruction of the premises. Y'all, you know, if the house burns down, y'all, you know, it's over. Y'all, you know, that you, they can't obviously they can't live there anymore. You're not collecting any more rent, so that would obviously terminate the lease. Condemnation. Now remember. Now what does con, What's another term for condemnation we talked about in an earlier chapter? Eminent domain. You know, is it possible the state might decide we need this property worse than the property owner and the tenant? So we're just taking it from both of you. That would terminate the lease. And then mortgage foreclosure will also terminate the lease. Y'all, and that's kind of sad for a lot. A lot of times tenants are paying their rent, but the property owner is not making their mortgage payment. So the bank forecloses on the property. And when that happens, if they foreclose, that terminates the lease. So tenant, you're, you got to leave. You know, and it kind of sucks for the tenant because they're being forced out of no, due to no fault of their own. So that is kind of bad there. Well, now we take a look at some different types of leases. Um, Y'all, this first one is what we call a graduated lease. Y'all graduate, y'all, now that you can see this, um, Y'all, just means there's a escalator clause built into the lease. And you can see this in a lot of residential leases, but you see it an awful lot in commercial leases. So either residential or commercial, but it's probably more common with commercial. But an escalator clause just means that, that it will um, cause an automatic increase, or in some cases, a decrease in rent after a certain period of time. You know, for example, you might sign, you know, if you do a commercial lease, a lot of times you might be signing, say, a five-year lease. That's not uncommon. Or maybe even longer than that. Well, they might say where your rent for the first two years is going to be $1,200 a month. But starting in year three, it will automatically go to $1,300 a month. Year four, it'll go to $1,400. Y'all, anyway, so you get the picture here. That's what they call an escalator clause. Um, that they put in the lease. And then if, if that clause is in the lease, then that's considered a graduated lease. A percentage lease is pretty entirely commercial. Um, this is a commercial lease. You don't see this in residential leases. But, you know, with a, with a percentage lease, typically the lease will actually require usually the tenant to pay some very small amount of base rent each month. But again, it's usually a very small amount, okay? But on top of whatever that base rent is that we've agreed upon, you also agree as, as the tenant to pay some percentage 
of whatever your net proceeds are for the month. Um, so obviously the more money you make, the more your rent's going to be. Uh, yeah, that's very common. That's a very common lease. You know, when you get into like, um, retail type of stores, the malls, for example, you know, if you rent space in a mall, you know, but obviously, you know, that's the way the mall makes money. The mall will get some percentage of every sale that takes place inside that mall. That's why you can see them set up in the hallway with these, I forget what they call these little, anyway, they'll have like a little bench or, or something set up in the hallway. They don't necessarily don't even have a storefront. But any sale that takes place inside that mall, uh, the mall's going to get some percentage plus whatever the base rent they agreed to pay. Um, so that's how that works. A net lease, again, much more common with commercial. I guess you could see it in some residential, but I, I think it'd be kind of rare. But with commercial leases, they will have what we call net, sometimes double net, triple net, and so forth. But y'all, with a net lease, that just means that tenant, in addition to whatever the rent is you agree to pay each month, you're also going to have to pay some prorated share of the, um, all the operational cost of that building or that facility, y'all, such as taxes, insurance. Uh, loan care, security, potentially. Y'all, any expense associated with that facility, the tenants within that facility, y'all, they'll prorate that expense and each tenant will pay their prorated share of whatever these expenses are. Y'all, and this is in addition to, on top of whatever your rent is. So, y'all, I will just tell you, y'all, if you ever decide to go rent commercial space, you better be asking that leasing agent, how much are the net costs? We know the, what we know the rent. You've told me how much the rent's going to be. What are those net costs going to wind up being? Y'all, I'm just telling you, that could wind up, in some cases, being almost as much, if not more, than the actual rent. Y'all, I'm telling you, it can be very expensive. And a lot of times, these leasing agents don't get into that. that y'all, they might make reference um, that you got to pay some portion of or some prorated share of these uh, operational costs. But a lot of times they don't state exactly what those costs are. And I would want to actually put a cap on it. I want to, you might say I have to pay some portion of the property taxes, but up to how much? Yeah, I want to know how much and I want to put a cap on it too. Um, yeah, so I'd be careful when you start signing these commercial leases. A gross lease is what you tend to see with residential leases. Okay. Um, you know, the gross lease, basically the tenant just pays for the rent and that's all they have to deal with. Y'all, you know, the landlord pays for all the um, operational and maintenance costs associated with the structure, the building, the house, whatever it is. Um, so the tenant is only paying the rent. You could have an index lease, again, primarily using commercial leases. Um, but this is a, a lease that's tied to some economic index, um, such as the CPI, y'all, you know, the Consumer Price Index. And basically what it's doing or, or requiring is, you know, if, if the index goes up, which if the economy is doing good and the index goes up, guess what? So does your rent. But on the flip side, if the economy is not doing so good right now and the index starts coming down, well, then so does your rent. So this is a really kind of a good lease to kind of make sure my, the rent that's being paid is in line with what the and with what and how the economy is doing at that time. All right. And then there's the ground lease. Y'all, these are long term leases. Y'all typically like 50 years. These are like 50 year leases. And again, you're just leasing the ground, y'all, the dirt, the land. Um, that's why they call it a ground lease. But occasionally, you know, you'll actually see these leases go up to as high as 99 years. 
Yo, that's a long time to be renting something, isn't it? 99 years. And you're probably going to be in at least your 20s or 30s before you ever sign the lease. And you got 99 years to rent. Yep, that seems like an awful long time to me. I think 50 years is a lot more common. Um, but that's what they do. Again, it's primarily used for commercial purposes. Y'all, and y'all, apparently there are tax benefits um, to the developer if I want to put a building on this property, but I don't actually own the land. So a lot of times they'll go in and do a ground lease. They'll lease the land for 50 years, maybe 99 years, and put some building on it to do whatever they want to do. And you know, and it could um, have some tax benefits by doing it this way. Uh, but, but what is a ground lease? You're re- it means you're leasing the ground for at least 50 years, maybe even up to 99 years. So now we look at some just common provisions in a lease agreement. Y'all probably not going to spend a whole lot of time on most of these. I think they're pretty self-explanatory. I'm sure you're probably familiar with these. But just things you see in a lease agreement. Y'all, you got to know the name and address of the landlord and the tenant. Got to include the property address that we're actually renting. The term of the tenancy. Y'all, how long is this lease good for? What's the rental amount? What kind of fees, y'all deposit, what security deposit, maintenance deposit, damage deposit, y'all, whatever kind of fees you're going to charge, y'all, they have to be included in the lease. Y'all, who's paying for the utilities, y'all, electricity, for the water? Is that something the tenant will have to pay on their own, or is the landlord paying for these services? Um, y'all, it must state the current condition of that rental unit, of the property. Y'all, if you're a tenant, you would want to do an, I would think, you'd want to do an inspection of that property before you move in. And if you see issues like a little hole in the wall here or something or something's not working, y'all, you better write all this out and put it in the lease. None of this was working when I moved in. So don't expect it to be working when I move out neither, right? Y'all, things that you don't identify in the lease as an issue Y'all, the owner could come back and say, well, no, you broke it. It was working fine when you moved in, so now you're going to have to pay for it. So as a tenant, you want to do a really good inspection um, and make notes of all the issues you encounter and make sure it's part of the lease. Um, Y'all, what are the tenant repairs and maintenance responsibilities? Y'all think that's pretty self-explanatory, but y'all, are you going to allow the tenant to make repairs themselves? Are you going to allow the tenant to just call a contractor to come fix stuff without going through you? I think that'd be awfully risky to do that, but um, y'all, whatever you agree to. We have to address when and how the landlord may enter the property. Y'all just to check on things, inspect things, make sure you're maintaining the property. Um... What kind of issues could we have with extended absences? Y'all, because one, we don't we don't want the landlord to charge uh, the tenant with abandonment because you have you've been gone for more than fifteen days and I didn't know about it. I didn't know where you were. I didn't know what's going on. I haven't seen haven't you haven't sent me your rent this month, right? So if you're going to be absent, y'all, you need to have something in there saying you need to talk to the property manager. Let me know what's going on. Or I may be taking some legal action against you. Um, limits on tenant behavior, y'all, what they can and cannot do within on the premises. Um, might have restriction on the number of occupants that would be in the property. Are you going to allow pets? Um, typically, if it's a residential property, I would probably have something really saying you cannot be conducting any kind of business from this property. Um, You may have a provision there um, basically taking away the tenant's right to disposition. Remember we were talking about that just a a little bit ago. Um, Y'all, it's part of the bundle of rights that a tenant gets, the right to dispose of, which means to assign or sublet that lease. 
Well, if the landlord puts in the lease that they are not conveying that right. In other words, it just says you tenant may not assign or sublet, then tenant, you cannot do that. You've waived that right but when you sign that lease, okay? <coughs> Excuse me. Um, if you're going to have guests over, we've got to set some ground, uh, some limits on how many, for how long they can stay. And then what are the grounds for the termination of lease? You know, and I will tell you, there's typically going to be a lot more than that in a lease. Um, and you'll, you'll just learn from experience, quite frankly. I need to put something in there that addresses this. You know, because I had a problem with this lease and I didn't have nothing, or with this tenant, and I didn't have anything in the lease to address it. You'll know to start adding some stuff to it. Um, Y'all make sure your attorney does that. Y'all don't be start drawing up your own contracts. And then, y'all, so we, we shift gears here a little bit to talk about this Uniform Residential Landlord and Tenant Act, or, y'all, the acronym is uh, ERTA. Um, y'all, this is really like a National Landlord and Tenant Act. Um, y'all, as it says here, it's, they're, y'all, they're just trying to set some uniform requirements among all the states when it comes to landlords and tenants. I think most states have adopted pretty much everything was within this act, um, but Pretty much every state has added to this act. So, and that's what we, you know, when I was talking about earlier, um, you know, we get in the state specific portion of this course, we'll address these landlord and tenant requirements um, more specifically at that time because that it addresses the, the specific state that you're trying to be licensed in. But right now, what you're looking at, y'all, for the most part, these are just some general requirements of landlords and tenants um, under this National Uniform Residential Landlord and Tenant Act. All right. So we list what the landlord's obligations would be. And again, y'all, it's all, pretty much all of this seems like common sense to me, but you know, the landlord must comply with building and housing codes. Imagine that. They must make repairs necessary to keep the property in habitable condition. Seems reasonable. Keep common air safe and clean. All right. Maintain systems. Y'all, your electrical, plumbing, heating and air, stuff like that. Got to maintain it. You got to provide for the removal of garbage. And you must supply water in reasonable amounts of hot water. Y'all, that must be available to tenants. Y'all, those are some of the landlord obligations. Y'all, I'll tell you, it'll get, that list will get probably a little more extensive when we look at the, um, your state-specific requirements. But then with the tenant's obligations, y'all, the tenant <clears throat> must comply with obligations imposed upon them. Y'all, they got to comply with the terms of the lease. They got to keep the premises safe and clean. They got to dispose of their own garbage. Keep plumbing fixtures clear and functional and use systems in a reasonable manner. Y'all don't tear stuff up. And if you do tear it up, tenant, you're going to repair it. You're going to fix it, replace it, whatever the case may be. <clears throat> but then the reason for this or purpose for this act, really just talked about it, but it's to kind of simplify um, how things will operate from a national standpoint. And it says there in the middle, really just to encourage landlords and tenants to maintain and improve the quality of housing. Okay. Um, and it does make sense that if, if all states were somewhat similar, uniform and how they enforce certain things, it, I think it would make things a whole lot easier. But I'm telling you, there are a lot of differences when it comes to the Landlord and Tenant Act um, for each state. But I think you'll find that each state, even though they have their own Landlord and Tenant Act, typically, is, it, what they have is built around this act. Okay. All right. Moving on. So, y'all, there's your um, property management.